this is Pastor Craig Raymond, thanking you for joining us for this week's Sunday Sermon. You know, God's Word is going to help us to get through these turbulent and uncertain times. No matter what may happen, no matter how long this pandemic may last, or whatever else is going on in our lives, it's through God that we find the hope and help and healing that we need. So, I hope you enjoy this week's Sunday service. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're doing a study, and we're just about at the end. We're on the downhill side of this thing two weeks to go, this Sunday and then next Sunday. We're doing a study in the book of Colossians. What makes Colossians so unique is that the Apostle Paul never actually knew these people to whom he's writing. He never visited Colossae, the city. He's heard about them. He's heard about this new church that got started. And now, through a mutual friend, he's going to write to them and encourage them and talk about how to live out our faith in Jesus Christ. It's an uplifting letter. It's an exciting and relevant letter to our day today, even though it was written 2,000 years ago. Imagine that. Well, as we come down the home stretch, Paul's going to list several of his friends that he had in his own gospel community, the support friends that he had in his life. And together, we're going to see the importance of being a part of a community. I call it a gospel community because that's where our faith is centered, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what unites us, that we have a common faith in a risen Lord. And so it's that good news of Jesus Christ that unites us, and we are called to be a body, to be connected, to be a part of a community. And let me just say that because of COVID these last seven months, and I get it, I know that we've had to shut things down, we're to shelter in place. Some of you watching me now online, I haven't seen you in seven months, and I want you to know I love you, and I miss you, and I look forward to the time when we can all be together. I understand the realities of what we're facing. But still, God has called us to connect. That's how he's wired us. And something unhealthy occurs over time if we're not connected. Satan loves the lone sheep, that one that's out there all by himself. Depression is up in America. Suicide is up. Divorce is up. All kinds of tensions and problems when things aren't normal. And one of the things we need to do as much as possible is stay connected. That's why we're going to emphasize, and we are going to be emphasizing, the importance of being in a small group. Maybe you're in a small group. Maybe uh, you'd like to get back into a small group. It's been a long time maybe that you've been in a small group. But small groups is where we grow the best. Yes, we need large group uh, assembly to worship God and praise Him and hear from God's Word. But we also need that interaction that can only happen in a small group where we get to know each other, where we begin to pray for one another and encourage one another and support one another. There are people going through battles, physical battles, financial battles, personal battles. And you shouldn't have to do that alone. And so we need to be the church that God has called us to be. And one of the things we do is gather together in small groups. So we're going to be emphasizing that. Paul's going to be listing kind of his support community that he went through during a difficult time in his life when he was in prison in Rome. As he closes the letter to Colossians, he lists name after name of those who have been there for him and who have supported him. And it leads us to the main point for today. And that main point is gospel community is based on friends worshiping and serving the Lord together. Now, we didn't start out as friends. We started out probably as strangers. We didn't know each other. But as we have come together and get to know each other and pour into each other's lives, we develop trust in one another, love for one another. We become bonded, as it were, a network of friends. That's the strength of a church, not just showing up for Sunday morning, as important as that is. But we need to be connected in a vital way, and that's what friends do. That's why we need to be connected in small groups. And so we're going to see that to be a healthy gospel community, you can't be closed off in your friendships, us four and no more. Sorry, we don't need more friends. No, we as a church always need to be open and accepting and inviting to anyone who comes into our doors. Amen, folks? We need to be a church that's always welcoming. That's the kind of church God wants us to be. And so we're a church not of closed friendships, but open friendships. Always willing to make a new friend. 
That's the spirit. That's the atmosphere that we need to have if we're going to be a healthy gospel community. Well, as I begin here, let me just say that the people we're going to read in Paul's list of names, they're all heroes of the faith. You need to understand the context of what we're reading. Paul is in prison in Rome. He is, it's dangerous to be around Paul. Think of him as kind of radioactive. Anybody gets close to Paul, well, they could be targeted as well. Their lives could be in danger. They too could be arrested and put in the jail cell with Paul. So it was kind of dangerous. It's risky to be close to Paul, to be a friend of Paul. But it didn't stop his friends from being close to him. They didn't abandon him. And folks, that's the true definition of a loyal friend or a true friend, and that is loyalty. Loyalty. Not a fair weather friend, but one who sticks with you through thick and thin. You have some friends like that? They're valuable. I want to read you a couple of passages from Proverbs just to kind of let you know what a friend is all about. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 says, A friend is always loyal. No matter what you're going through, what battle you're facing. And a brother is born to help in time of need. They're there for you. That's a true friend. Proverbs 18, 24 says, There are friends who destroy each other. They turn on each other. They snipe at each other. There's way too much drama between them. That's not good. That's not healthy. But then he says, there's a real friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's the kind of friend we need to be to others. A loyal friend who sticks closer than a brother. True friends don't forsake each other, especially in a time of trouble. And Paul's friends didn't forsake him. So let's go through this list of names. Let's discover who these people are. And each one, we're going to have a characteristic about true friendship that we're going to learn. What does it mean to be a friend? Well, we're going to look at this, and this week and next week, and we'll close out the letter to the Colossians, uh, we're going to look at several characteristics of being a true friend. So let's look at it together. Let's look at the first name that Paul lists here, and that's a man by the name of Tychicus. Kind of a strange name, Tychicus. Verse 7 and 8 of Colossians chapter 4, Paul writes, As to all my affairs, what's going on in my life, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant to the Lord, will bring you information. He'll tell you what's going on in my life. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage, strengthen your hearts. As far as giving you news about me, Paul writes. Tychicus, we don't know a lot about him. But Paul mentions him because he was the mailman. He was the one who delivered the letter from Paul in Rome all the way to Colossae. Paul also gave him another letter to deliver, and that was to the city of Ephesus, to the small church there. We know it as the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians. Tychicus was the delivery person. But what I want you to know is that this was no convenient, easy thing. It's not a matter of Tychicus getting on an airplane and zipping from Rome over to Colossae in Asia Minor and, and, and showing up. This was a journey of a thousand or more miles. Uh, this was an arduous, difficult journey. And yet when Paul says, I need someone to deliver this letter to the Colossians, and here's also one for the Ephesians, Tychicus said, here, Paul, you can trust me, I'll do it. I'll, I'll carry it out. Wow. And it leads us to our first characteristic of a true friend. True friends help each other. They help each other. Paul needed Tychicus to do him a favor, deliver some letters. And Tychicus was more than happy to do it. That's a mark of a true friend. Friends help each other when they're in need. Think of someone in your life who has helped you in your chores or things that you needed, projects. Maybe you're in a point of needing travel and you needed someone to get you there, like to an airport, and you, you who would you call? 
Who's that friend that comes to mind that if you needed help, you would call them? Well, one of my closest friends is right here, John Jameson. I want to embarrass him for a moment because uh, John's been that kind of friend to myself and my family. Uh, there's been times in the past where he drove us over to Seattle to catch a, a flight. Uh, I remember a couple years ago, there was a flight that we were going to take to Hawaii, our family. This was about three, four years ago. And John was willing to drive us over there so we can get on our flight. Well, there was a snowstorm. Uh, Snoqualmie Pass was closed. We were listening to Seahawks, and that was so depressing. They were losing. And I said, Paul, uh, John, can you turn that off? I, I, this is distressing. We were stopped in traffic, as some of you have experienced, in I-90. Couldn't go anywhere, and I'm thinking we're going to miss our flight. John was so calm, so supportive. We're going to make it. We're going to get there. He got about there about 15 minutes in time to get there as far as our window. But we got there. We're the, well, that was great. Two weeks ago, two of my sons and I went on a road trip. We were going to be gone long enough where I needed someone to help mow the lawn. I turned to John and said, John, would you be willing to mow my lawn for me? He's done it in the past. He said, sure, I'll be glad to do it. That's a friend. That's someone who, if you need someone, he's there and he's willing to say, I'll help you. Who comes to mind? The more importantly, be that kind of friend to others. So thank you, John. You're a true friend and I love you. But we need to have those kind of friends and be that kind of a friend. That's the kind of friend Tychicus was. Paul's in prison. He couldn't travel. And when he needed someone to deliver some letters, huh, Tychicus said, I'll make the journey. I'll go the distance. Count on me, Paul. Wow, that's incredible. The next person we have on the list is a man by the name of Onesimus. Very interesting story here. Who was Onesimus? Well, Paul writes in verse 9, he says, And with him, with Tychicus, another one who he sent, was a man by the name of Onesimus. He calls him our friend and our beloved brother who is one of your number, one of your own. In other words, he's a local yokel from Colossae. He was one of the locals there in, in Colossae. And he says, I'm sending him back to you. They, Tychicus and Onesimus, will inform you about the whole situation here. Who was Onesimus? Onesimus was a runaway slave who had somehow reached Rome, contacted Paul, and now Paul was sending him back to his master. His master was a man by the name of Philemon. If you know your New Testament, you know that there's a little postcard in the New Testament, a little one-chapter letter called Philemon. It's about Onesimus, this runaway slave. And Paul's telling him, uh, Philemon, to accept Onesimus back, not just as a runaway slave, but as a faithful, devoted follower of Christ, a brother in Christ. And what I want you to notice here is Paul's description of Onesimus. He doesn't refer to him as a runaway slave, but as a faithful and beloved brother in Christ. You know, that's what friends do for each other. They speak well of each other. You don't have to worry about what a friend is saying behind your back. You can trust them. That's a sign of a true friend. And it leads us to the second characteristic of friendship. Characteristic number two, true friends support each other. They support each other in, the, in, the eye, in, the, in front of others. They support each other, each other in the front of others. Friends don't trash you behind your back. Instead, they've got your back. A, new, a true friend knows the worst about you, but they love you anyway. And they don't focus on your faults, but your better characteristics and qualities. They don't dwell on the negative about you. They dwell on the positive. And yes, a true friend will be honest with you. If they need to speak to you and correct you, and share with you something you don't want to hear, they'll do it. Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6 talks about a true friend. It says, deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. They'll flatter you. But faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend will say what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear. So a friend will be honest with you. They just don't focus on your past, the mistakes of your past. They don't focus on the old you. They focus on the new you. They believe in you. And that's what Paul's doing here with Onesimus when he calls him a faithful and beloved brother in Christ. 
what we know from the book of Philemon is Onesimus stole from his master, Philemon. He ran away. And he journeyed somehow all the way to, to Rome where he met Paul, who introduced him to Jesus. Onesimus then became a devoted follower of Christ. His life was turned around. His new identity was one of a, of a believer in Jesus. So instead of calling him a thief and a runaway, Paul calls him now a faithful and beloved brother. Wow, we need friends like that. Friends who believe in us, who support us, will speak well of us before others. So don't badmouth your friends. Don't criticize them and, 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 and go after them in front of others. That's not a good sign. That's not a true friend. True friends support each other in front of others. True friends don't tear each other down. We need more of those kind of friends. Would you agree with that? We do. Be that kind of friend yourself. And then the third person that we're going to be looking at that Paul lists is a man by the name of Aristarchus. Aristarchus. It's a long name. I'll just call him Ari. Ari for short. In verse 10, Paul writes, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings. He was with Paul in Rome. It's an incredible story that we are going to learn about him. What do we know about him from the Bible? Well, all we know comes from three passages. And they're all from the book of Acts. In Acts 19.29, we learn that Ari, Aristarchus, was with Paul when he was in Ephesus when the riot broke out. And Ari stood with Paul. He was loyal. We learn in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, that Ari was a Greek. He was not Jewish in origin. He was Greek. He was, from, he was a Macedonian from the city of Thessalonica, Acts 20, verse 4. And then in Acts chapter 27, verses 1 and 2, Acts 27, 1 and 2, we learn that Ari traveled to Rome with Paul, who was under arrest. That's what we know from Scripture. Here, Paul, notice, calls Aristarchus my fellow prisoner. Now, this is an incredible story. As much as we can put together, scholars have come to the conclusion that Ari was in jail with Paul there in Rome. History tells us that Ari, Aristarchus, registered himself as Paul's slave so he could travel with Paul and be with him during his time of hardship. Imagine that. He wasn't Paul's slave. But Roman law allowed a prisoner to keep a slave with him to attend to his own needs when he was under arrest. And so when it came time to get on a ship and sail to Rome, Aristarchus says, I'm Paul's slave. I want to go with him. And the Roman soldiers let him. Can you imagine that? I'm willing to claim the role of a slave to help my friend. Wow. And so Paul calls him his fellow prisoner. He's in jail with Paul tending to his needs. Incredible story. Incredible. And so we learn characteristic number three of a true friend. True friends sacrifice for each other. They do what they have to do to help each other. They're willing to even sacrifice their time and their resources, their treasure, and even their freedom. The freedom, like Harry did for Paul. Friends are willing to sacrifice for each other. The ultimate sacrifice anybody can make is to give your life for someone. Jesus, remember, said in John 15, 13, he said, Greater love has no one than this that want than one lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did for us. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what a friend who gave his life for us. And it's not when we were his buddy. We didn't even know about him or care about him. Romans chapter 5 says, while we were his enemies, Jesus died for us. That's how big his heart is. True friends are willing to sacrifice for each other. It's an incredible story that Aristarchus was willing to claim that he was Paul's slave when he wasn't, just so he could be with Paul during his hardship. Incredible. Incredible. This is the kind of commitment that makes Christianity so compelling. 
so dynamic. The people out there, they need friendships just like us in here. And when they see us caring for one another, supporting one another, it draws them like a magnet because they want that as well. They want to be a part of that kind of loving and supportive community. Let's go to the fourth name on Paul's list. It's a man by the name of Mark, one of the most interesting individuals you'll find in the New Testament. In verse 10, Paul continues his list of friends. He says, and also Barnabas' cousin, Mark, about whom you received instructions that if he comes to you or when he comes to you, to welcome him. Now that's interesting. Why would Paul need to give special and specific instructions for them to welcome Mark? Well, it's probably because Mark wasn't always welcomed by Paul. And he wants the people in Colossae to know that things are now different between them. To understand this, you need to understand a little bit of background, so let me share it with you. Of all the people mentioned in the early church, Mark's story is one of the most interesting. Mark was a close friend to Peter. In fact, later in life, Peter will refer to Mark as his son. He wasn't biologically a son, but as far as connection and relationship, he was like a son. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Mark was the one who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write one of the Gospels that we have in the New Testament. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, we're talking about that Mark who wrote the Gospel, the Gospel of Mark. And it was based on the eyewitness account of Peter. So Mark's Gospel is really Peter's Gospel. On Paul's first missionary journey, Mark traveled with Paul and Barnabas to the many different places. He was their writer, probably the one who handled their luggage, their baggage. And somewhere along the way, we don't know when, we don't know where, Mark got homesick. He basically said, I've had enough of this. I'm tired of this. I'm going home. So Mark left Paul and Barnabas on, his, on their first missionary journey. He went home. Barnabas, who is Mark's uncle, was willing to forgive him and to basically overlook him, but not Paul. Months later, when Paul and Barnabas planned to go back out onto the road and visit those churches that they had started on their second missionary journey, Barnabas says, hey, I'd like to take my nephew Mark. And Paul said, nothing doing, no way. Uh-uh. He deserted us. He left us. I'm not taking a chance on him again. In fact, Acts chapter 15 tells us the argument between Paul and Barnabas became so heated that they left each other, traveled their own way, and they never teamed up again. That's sad. And it was over Mark that the issue was. So Paul wanted nothing to do with this Mark. But, like in our own lives, God can change our hearts. Think about in your life when you were close towards someone. God eventually softened your heart to forgive that person. That's what happened with Paul. We know, and we don't know exactly how it happened, when the reconciliation occurred. We just know that it did occur. Because at the end of Paul's life, when he was in prison in Rome for a second time, his last imprisonment, Mark was with him. And he refers to Mark as being invaluable, a valuable asset in his ministry. 2 Timothy 4.11, if you want to trace that story. 2 Timothy 4.11. Mark is there with Paul in his final stay in prison. So what happened? Well, we can only conclude that Paul forgave Mark and accepted him back into his circle of friends. He gave Mark a second chance, which is what friends do with each other. And it leads us to our fourth characteristic of a friend, a true friends forgive each other. They forgive. They don't continue to bear grudges against each other. Their heart remains open. Yes, sometimes we get hurt by our friends. Sometimes we want nothing more to do with those we feel betrayed us hurt us by what they said or what they did. 
But God can bring healing, especially when your heart remains open to reconciliation. That's the kind of heart God wants us to have in our lives. So I want you to think about in your life, is there someone who has hurt you in the past that you need to forgive? You need to say, Lord, help me to forgive. Help me to bury this thing and, and get past this thing and not me remain frozen to what happened in the past. Help me to have an open heart toward this person. Who is that person that God's putting on your heart right now? Ask him. It's sometimes the hardest thing you can ever do is to forgive someone who's truly hurt you. But God forgave us, remember? In Christ Jesus, he wants us to do the same toward each other. So one of the signs of a true friendship is, yes, we're going to hurt each other. Sometimes we're like porcupines on a cold winter night. We need each other to stay warm, but we keep prickling each other, offending each other. There's a point where we need to have those conversations that says, you know what you said, hurt me. I don't want that between us. You have that conversation. But you seek to reconcile. Your heart remains open. That's a sign of true friendship. It's a sign of Christ dwelling within you, that you have a forgiving heart. So God wants us to be bridge builders, not wall builders. Paul was, and we need to be the same toward those who have let us down in the past. And it's a good thing Paul forgave and reconciled with Mark, because legend has it that Mark went on later in his life down to Egypt, and he started a church in Alexandria, that became one of the strongest churches in the ancient world. All started by Mark. So don't give up on people. Sometimes you have to be willing to give them a second chance. Or a third chance. <laughs> or maybe a fourth chance. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. It's a great story of reconciliation between Paul and Mark. And then the final name that we have here is a man by the name of Justice. Verse 11 says, and also Jesus, that's an interesting name, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers, Paul says, for the kingdom of God, who are from the circumcision, mean their fellow Jews, and they, that is Mark and Justice, have proven to be an encouragement to me. Justice was one of the fellow or few Christians who were Jewish, and helping Paul to reach Gentiles. What a great, noble statement to make about him. He was from Jewish descent, and yet he's out there sacrificing to share the gospel to those who are not of the same ethnicity, far from home. Other than this verse, we know nothing about justice, except what Paul tells us, that justice and Mark had proven to be an encouragement to Paul. And it leads us to our final characteristic of a true friend. True friends encourage each other. They support one another, but they encourage. They know how to lift up each other. A verse, if you're taking notes, you might want to write down is Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 and 10, it says, Two are better than one, because if one of them falls, the other can that's what you need a friend for. Sometimes emotionally, we can go through down times. Think about the last time you were discouraged. Maybe you're discouraged now. It's easy to be discouraged. But a friend knows how to reach you, and encourage you, and lift you up. And that's what justice was, along with Mark, to the great apostle Paul. They were encouragers. And folks, that's why we need to connect especially in small groups. Don't stay isolated. Who knows how long this pandemic is going on? We have an election in just under three weeks. Uh, it's, we are so divided as a nation, and do not think that this election is going to heal our nation, whichever side wins. This division is only going to grow and get worse. Craziness is our world today. Craziness. And more than ever, we need to have a strong, caring group of friends. A band of brothers and sisters who we can grow with, pray with, support, learn the scriptures with, 
as iron sharpens iron, one person sharpening another, but encouraging and supporting. Who knows the battles we're going to face, not only just individually, but nationwide and worldwide. How much we need to be together and supporting each other and encouraging each other. If the great apostle Paul needed friends, how much more do we? If the great apostle Paul needed friends who encouraged him, how much more do we? So just think about your life. Who are you connected to? I want to invite you and encourage you to get involved in a small group. We're going to be emphasizing that in the weeks to come. But we need to. That's our network. That's what's going to keep us strong in the Lord. Again, Satan loves that lone sheep out there by themselves. Don't be that lone sheep. Stay connected. So we need friends who are going to be there with us, who share our faith, who are going to strengthen us. And when we get down, they know how to pick us up. I want to ask you, who do you know right now who's going through a discouraging time? Who do you know that's maybe struggling? Maybe a physical issue they're battling with? A a financial battle? Maybe it's an emotional, relational battle that they're facing? How can you encourage them? Email them and just let them know that you're thinking of them and praying for them. Send them a note. You have no idea the encouragement that can bring. One thing friends do is they are there for you when you're in, in trouble. I remember when our son, our oldest son, Jason, had a car accident a long time ago, about 20 years ago. And he had to get rushed to the emergency room. And Chris and I, in a daze of shock, were there in that emergency room. For nine days afterwards, he was in that hospital. But we found out our true friends because they came down. They said, how are you doing? You ever hear that one of your friends is in a hospital? You don't delay a moment. You get down there. You let them know I'm there for you. I love you and I'm here and anything I can do. Back home, anything you need me to do. That's what friends do. That's what we need. So folks, let's be the gospel community that God has called us to be, especially in these crazy times. Who knows how long this pandemic is going to last. We can't stay isolated from each other. So let's connect. Let's encourage. Let's support one another. And let's be the church that God wants us to be. Amen? So think about in your life. Who do you need to reach out to and encourage? Your words have power to heal, to lift up. Let's, let's take advantage of that and reach out to each other. God bless you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can spend this time right now in your word, and we just pray that you would help us to reach out to those you've put in our lives, to be that true friend, to assist and encourage and support, and yes, when necessary, even forgive. But Father, I pray that you would just strengthen us to be the community of faith right here in this valley that we need to be. And it's all based on a network of friends who are willing to open up and Except new friends, never a closed group, always open, always inviting, always welcome. And I pray that we would be that kind of church. Thank you for our time here. And if anyone doesn't know you, haven't put their faith in you, I pray that they would right now so that they could enter into the fellowship of Jesus. Oh, what a friend we have in him. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do in Jesus' name.